can you describe what you think Revolution Summer was? You know, I think that the, the term Revolution Summer has created an image which is a little bit inaccurate in a way, or given people sort of a, I think it was a sense that pe people think of it in a way that it was like this kind of like, I mean, the word revolution obviously is rather loaded. Mm. I can tell you from my perspective exactly what it was. Um, in the early 80s, you know, we had a very, D.C. had a very tight-knit, thri <laughs> thriving underground punk scene. Yeah. And <clears throat> that punk scene, I mean, we really was, we became like a family. Everybody was very close. And then as things, you know, as they expand, things become diffuse, right? So more and more people came in, which was exciting, but then the sort of later people who came in later had a sort of a different idea of what punk was. Um, specifically, um, because of the way the media had treated punk rock, a lot of the later people who came into it later, we'll talk about this one or two years later even, yeah. their, <clears throat> their perception of it was much more um, based on sort of violent behavior. Yeah. Because that's the way media had portrayed it. So a lot of people came into it thinking like, well, that's what we were supposed to do. We're supposed to be, we're supposed to fight. Um, <clears throat> and then at some point, and this kind of largely kind of, I think, came out of, you know, in England there was this sort of oi scene. Yeah. Um, which was, you know, skinheads and punks. But it was sort of, there was a slightly weird, like, there was a connection to the National Front. Oh, yeah. Um, and that kind of translated, that re resonated with kids over here, some kids over here. Um, and so we started to get these skinhead gangs um, and these general kind of, People who sort of, I think, you know, identify with oi or street punk, <clears throat> and uh, they're they were sort of like fuck shit up people, basically. And then you had this very loose. <clears throat> sorry, if there's some a lot of dust here right now because. Sorry, uh, yes. Um, there was this very loose kind of political bent, which was had to do with um, <clears throat> sort of right wing politics, um, especially the skinhead kids. Yeah. Since Washington was <clears throat> is a was a majority black city, people who wanted to behave like be racist, they were really, um, yeah, that was not a good plan for them. So they became very nationalist. Yeah, you follow? Like they were really into like the U.S. So they were. Oh, yeah. one of the, so they were basically targeting people who they felt were not properly nationalist, meaning you know people who would have like an American flag upside down on their jacket or, or okay. and then it got to the point where people would be wearing, seriously wearing like a red t-shirt or a red shoelaces, which suggests communist, you know? And yeah. Basically they're just looking for a fight. And okay. what resulted was a situation where the shows became increasingly more moronically violent and yeah. older punks, we're talking about people just a few years older, became uh, increasingly alienated by this and didn't really understand, didn't recognize, um, they were, they didn't, they didn't recognize what was going on anymore as being anything positive. So yeah. there was basically this general drift where people were like, well, fuck it, I'm going to drop out. I don't want to be a part of this anymore. Um, but there was a bunch of us who thought, well, fuck that. Like, you know, we're not going to fight these people and we're not going to drop out. We're just going to start another scene, another okay. yeah. scene in Washington. They can have their scene, they can have their shows, they can do whatever they want to do, but we're just going to start another scene. Uh, with it, you know, it'd still be punk to us, and it'll have our sort of, sort of, it'll have our kind of um, principles and our sort of ideas about what something, what an underground community could be. And initially, we were going to do it in the fall of 1984. Uh, Ian, can I ask a question? Yeah. Who, who are you referring to when you say we? Well, I would say the bands that were loosely connected with the Discord label. Yeah. So a band like, um, bands like, well, obviously Rights of Spring was sort of the the main band, but then it was King Face and Beef Eater. Yeah. Um, and then basically these are bands that came out of this thing. But well, uh, let me finish. The question yeah, was like a bunch of people who were affiliated with sort of the early Discord scene. So yeah. people from Faith and, you know, Minor Threat and, you know, bands like, all these bands, Great Matter, these sorts of bands. Mm. 
it was basically this idea like we're going to create something new. So we had, we actually had, like we got together and had almost had meetings basically talking about like how are we going to, what are we going to do? And they said, okay, we're gonna, in the fall of 84, everybody is going to get busy. We're going to form bands. We're going to start magazines. You know, we're going to, you know, we're just going to get, we're going to, you know, do do art. We're, people are going to, you're going to write, you're going to write. Whatever you're going to do, this is, we're going to get active and creative. Yeah. Um, and I think that we were becoming more politically, um, we were thinking about things more politically because we were also all getting into our mid-20s. And in the beginning of the punk scene, it was very, everything was extremely sort of, the discussion was largely about the personal politics, but this we realized, started to see that there was a connection with the larger world. So yeah. a lot of more like feminist ideas and <clears throat> anti-racist ideas, yeah. essentially left-wing perspectives. Um, or progressive perspectives, mm -hmm. and um, so the idea was everyone was going to get active in the fall of '84. We had something that we called Good Food October, um, yeah. which was all we did was just we just named it. We were just like trying to come up with a moniker, just something to target. Like, okay, in October, Good Food October, everybody's going to do something. But mm -hmm. October came and went. There was still we just no one, people were not kind of. There was problems, and you know, a lot of the people who were they're, they're working on, they hadn't been able to get up and running, and it sort of, you know, 84 slipped past us. So then it was decided, okay, you know, let's do it by the summer. Let's just do it by the summer. And then someone just said, okay, this will be Revolution Summer. This is the summer we're gonna we're gonna turn like, we're gonna turn the wheel. We're gonna do something. We're gonna revolve. So we just aimed for the summer, and then that had given us another, you know, six to eight months past October to get shit done. And in, in that time frame, um, all these bands like Embrace or Lunch Meat or, you know, these bands started to actually, they formed and people started doing stuff and it was a much more, I mean, it did actually happen. There was all these protests we were doing, we were doing these actions um, and the dialogue started to really develop in a way that was, you know, that was sort of the, I guess, the, the dialogue that we kind of created, the conversation we created, actually started to take hold. And the shows, when they started happening, were really um, amazing because the sort of skinhead world didn't know what to make of it and hated it for the most part. Yeah. So, you know, we were for, you know, usually they would boycott it, which was perfect for us. You know, or if they came and tried to, you know, be dicks, it was so clearly... Um, yeah, it was just so obvious that they were being dicks because everybody else was so not being not being dicks. There was just nothing to hide behind anymore. There was no kind of uh, there was no group behavior in which they could hide behind. So if they came to fight, then they were like the only people fighting. It makes them look idiotic, and they yeah. are, looked idiotic because they were idiots. Yeah. So that would be my perception of Revolution Summer. That it was just it was a somewhat uh, deliberate attempt, I and mean, some of this is obviously natural too, but it was a deliberate attempt to try to reclaim, um, not reclaim, to reestablish our own, or to recommit ourselves to the ideas of punk, the, the original idea that we had in the first place. So it was just yeah. a recommittal, and we didn't, I mean, I think other cities, people were like, we need to, they wanted to fight the skinheads and beat them out of the city, or beat them out of the scene, but I thought that was ridiculous. Because, you know, the thing is, skinheads, those kids at the time, they're just being assholes. And yeah. I think assholes are essentially a virus. Viruses never go away. They just manifest in different places or other times. Yeah. So you could kill, I could have like murdered every skinhead thug in Washington. It wouldn't have actually done anything. There's still going to be assholes in the world. And the fact is that even the worst skinhead thug, it's just a person. They just got themselves into a bad way. They're not well. And yeah. I don't think people who are unwell should be murdered. So uh, what I thought was instead of giving them, instead of engaging them in the, in the, speaking to them in the only language they actually speak, which was violence, let's let's just do our own thing. Let's just get away from them. Yeah. What brought about the emergence of Revolution Summer? Uh, do you think, would you say it's, it was solely the skinheads? Well, I would say that it was mostly... Everybody, I think, again, like I chose my words carefully, like to recommit ourselves to the ideas of punk that we first, that we first thought about. So even though the yeah. skinhead kids, that, I, that, that's a, kind of a, an easy illustration of what some of, why we felt people were feeling alienated from the very kind of community that they had 
been sort of had been so foundational in their lives. Yeah. Um, it was not just like oh, the skinheads made us have, made us do it. It was really had to do with the drift that I think is quite natural for people. They get involved with something and they start to kind of drift on it. And they don't really know why they were doing it in the first place. And I think that really what was happening was like how do we recommit? How do we find the sort of the the sort of energy and the creativity that we felt so clearly a few years earlier, and the idea was we just need to be delivered about it. We need to fucking go for it. We need to actually commit ourselves yeah. and not yeah. sort of that's that was more to do. So I don't want to simplify it by saying like skinheads were there, and then we had to do we 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 said okay, we're going to start a new scene. It's rather that the whole scene was a drift. It was like a sort of a. Um, you know, it's like if you're looking at a movie or if you're looking at something and, and, and it starts to go out of focus and you can't really pay attention anymore. Yes. Yeah. Adjusting the focus again. Do you think the scene was, like, stagnating? What's that? Do you think the scene was stagnating? Definitely. But I think that everything, any, anything can... I mean, let's put it this way. Our, my, I'm speaking for myself. My perception or my relationship with the scene definitely started to stagnate because... Yeah. Um, I did not relate to what was going on with a lot of the people at the shows because they were behaving um, very poorly. And I thought, well, why would I want to be a part of something? Like, why would I, why would I want to be a part of something um, that is so ugly? Uh, mm. And even more, more to the point is how did something that I think was so beautiful become something that was so ugly? So I started to detach myself in a way that's sort of like, well, you know, I don't. You know, I'm not going to deal with that. So there, that's a stagnation. So instead of going in there with a broom, see, that's the thing. It's not a fixed location. Punk, yeah. like the punk scene or the underground, it's not a fixed location. It actually is. Can be anything you want to be. So you can move to the side. You just make a. You step aside. Say, okay, you guys have that. We're going to do another one. I mean, the only thing that the, the only thing that really would, have any kind of literal sort of effect, like an actual effect in terms of location would be the venues. Um, but even in that degree, the venues, there were certain venues in D.C. where they were doing these punk shows where the other scene would do their thing. And I actually didn't, didn't go to those places. Yeah. How are we no different than, I mean, where do you live? Uh, well, I live in a place called Salford, which is just next to Manchester. Okay, well, so you know in Manchester... Have you ever gone into clubs there? I'm sure there's oh, yeah, places yeah. you're like, you're like, all right, well, I'm just not, that's a place I don't go to. Yeah. You know, it's just like it's not my thing. Um, and there's other places you would go to. And occasionally there might be an event at a venue where, you know, a number of different things happen. You may cross paths with those other people. But by and large, it's the same kind of deal. Mm. The point was that there was like this idea of the ownership of the word punk. But I realized that their punk is just... Punk is not just slippery, it is elusive. You can't fucking get a hold of it because it is actually a reflection of the of the of an individual's philosophy. It is just that. You know, like what how people perceive punk is that is what punk is. Yeah, I like it's that. free space in my mind. Yeah. Yeah, I totally do that, yeah. I know what you mean. It's not so fixed, it's kind of what how you interpret you know, interpret it. Of course, yeah, because like if you want to make like some people saw punk as a way to destroy things, but I saw punk create things. You know, that's what I saw. I saw it as construction work, not destruction work. Yeah, yeah, it, it saw it, it empowers you. You know, well, of course, you... yeah, definitely, yeah. I'm with you. That doesn't mean just because I believe that doesn't mean that I think that other people. Like, they don't have the right to say it's, it's destruction. They can say whatever they want to say. I'm not, my energy is not going to be spent trying to correct people. My energy is going to be spent trying to create things or help people create things. Yeah. yeah. So would you say that, you know, Discord, the, the Discord kids, they sort of spearheaded the movement? Or would you say it's part, was, it, was Positive Force involved with it all as well? Positive Force came later, actually. Oh, I thought so. Yeah. They came kind of out of the same era. They were like, we were, I mean, we definitely, the actual, the actual revolution, some of the, like, naming it and the whole thing, Positive Force had almost nothing to do with that in the very beginning. They, we didn't know Mark Anderson. Oh, okay. Ironically, when you called through and I was on the other line, I was talking to Mark Anderson. Oh, right. Was doing a documentary. That's weird. <laughs> He's working on a documentary about Positive Force, so we were just discussing that. But, um, the, uh, 
you know, we just had just started to kind of get to know Mark um, in late 84 um, or maybe summer of 84, but pos- the revolution summer thing, yeah. like the, that, that was not something that he was, um, that he wasn't a part of the kind of crafting of it. But once we got involved with it, I think that really resonated with what the positive force group was thinking about. So there was a kind of a, uh, a joining on that front. But, like, you know, it's an interesting fact that, you know, like I've never been a member of positive force. I've never, I've only been, they've had meetings for, you know, 25 years. I've only been to two meetings in my life. Uh-huh. Um, I don't, I'm just not a part of their thing. I've been, well, I've worked closely with them. They, they did actually have a hand in, Organizing, I think, almost every Fugazi show in D.C. Okay. You know, they were they were they basically organized a lot. Of, they worked on the, they helped p- promote the shows with us. But by and large, we're separate. We're very separate entities. Okay. Well, I had a different idea, so that's good to know. Yeah. You know, and so I, yeah, so Mark has never been. He's never worked for Discord. Been a part of Discord, and I've never been a part of Positive Force. They're separate, totally, and they're group, different groups. Like the people who identify as, sorry, the people who are involved with the Discord like label and the people in the band, by and large, were not the people who were in the Positive Force group. They're separate groups. Doesn't mean there was any, there was no, you know, there was no, like nobody, there wasn't hatred or anything like that. It was nothing like that. It's okay. just that we just had different, we were still working on different things. So it was, you would say it was like Discord, your, the, the, the group that, sort of spearheaded it and kind of created it? I would say it was bands like, Righteous Spring is sort of, the, was again like the band that was the most sort of, I think kind of really inspired everybody. And I'd say it was a band, like, again, you know, and obviously there was Embrace and Kingface, Beef Eater, uh, Lunch Meat, Later, Grey Matter, and there's a few other bands, but, but it was mostly the people who came to see the band. So it wasn't necessarily people who were on the label, but just that that was that scene. And virtually, yeah. like all those bands, you know, there was a deep Discord connection. I mean, obviously, Right to Spring, uh, yeah. you know, uh, was on Discord. Embrace, obviously, was in Discord. King Face, you know, practiced at Discord House, and the singer Mark Sullivan was with the singer in the first band I was ever in in 1979. He's one mm. of my dearest friends. I was, you know, saw him visiting with him yesterday. Um, you know, the uh, Lunch Me was Mark's younger brother, Bobby, and that okay. band became Soul Side, who were on Discord. Yeah. Um, so basically, it's all these bands that were really these bands that were really closely associated with Discord and then the people who liked the bands and then, you know, just connect, were connected to it through that. So, yeah, I would say, I wouldn't say it was the Discord thing, but, it, like, Discord, the label didn't do it, but sort of the Discord community, whatever that, you know, the sort of extended community, I would say, was pretty much behind it. Um, but mm-hmm. once it got going, other people kind of came in, like, you know, the Positive Force people got involved and, and there were other people who were attracted to came in because they were excited by this yeah. development, because it was an opportunity to be involved with a punk scene that didn't mean getting your teeth knocked out. Yeah. What? What? Um, I know that um, supposedly, from what I've read in Dance of Days, um, Amy Pickford. I've never read, by the way. You've not read it, no. Never read it because right. I knew that it would be too confusing for me to read about my own history. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah, a- Amy Pickering supposedly sent a lot of letters round. Is that right? Yeah. That's true. Yeah. Did they? Actually, did they? Were they important? She was working for. She worked for Discord. See, and yeah. she used. So that was sort of the. That's what I'm saying. She was a mail order person at Discord. She worked for M- NPC she as well. Held those things out to everybody, and I actually I have a couple of them. Yeah. Oh do you? Sure. Are they? Are they quite lengthy or are they short? Oh, no, they're just one page, and it just says. Usually, it would just be something cryptic, like "Get ready, it's Revolution Summer." Yeah. That's all I would say. Did, do you think they actually they had an impact? Yes, I mean I, th- I know I mean I can say the fact that you're asking me about it would say I would say absolutely. Um, I mean, it's 25 years later and you're asking me about it, so it must have had some impact. <laughs> yeah, it must have. In terms of the actual at the time, I think it was just um, it was an ing- it was an ingredient that really helped everybody move along. Sure, I mean Amy was very very much a proponent. I mean, she was in the band Fire Party, which I think came directly out of Re- yeah. Revolution Summer, although a little, a little bit later. Um, but they were, that was definitely, they were, you know, the people involved with the band Fire Party were really hugely involved with, with Revolution Summer. And Amy, I think, was very much interested in the idea of kickstarting something. Okay. And I think that, so I think that by doing that, that was just, I mean, I think it was an impulse on her part, but I think it was inspiring because it gave everybody like, yeah, you know, 
let's fucking do this. Do you think Revolution Summer um, transformed the music of DC Punk and the values and ethics of DC Punk? I think the bands and the people associated with that era changed the music and the politics. But when yeah. you say Revolution Summer, this is where it gets a little tricky. Yeah. Like we saw Revolution Summer, it was not an entity unto itself. It was merely, it was just a call to arms. Yeah. See what I'm saying? So, yes, I would say in 1985, there was a decisive shift in the history of the DC under, punk underground scene. Yeah. No doubt. You can't deny it. Um, but I don't want to say Revolution Summer did it because that, because you get into the, what, you know, that gets, you get into the sort of the specifics of what, how you would define Revolution Summer. So it wasn't, um, again, it wasn't like a, um, it wasn't a government decree. It wasn't a decree. It was rather just people trying to get busy and then setting a date and giving it a name. Mm. And it didn't all happen, you know, that summer. I mean, Revolution Summer, the spirit of Revolution Summer, it actually started a year before and lasted for, you know, four years after or something. Yeah. There were still people energized by that. It was just an idea. The idea was really that this group of people, again, wanted to recommit themselves to sort of the idea of punk as a creative, constructive um, community as opposed to a destructive one or a nihilistic one. Yeah. Did you, would you say people like in about like Rise of Spring, do you think they intentionally changed the music or was it was it just a natural progression? You know, because the music, you know, they, they came up with this. I would say it's a natural progression and I think it's interesting. People talk a lot about this sort of like how, you know, like the lyrical matter also, but if you actually were to get the Meyer Thread discography and you listen to the first song we wrote to the last song, it's pretty broad sweep, like you start to see the natural evolution. And I would say that Right to Spring didn't come at something like, okay, we're going to make this sort of, we're going to create a different music. What they were playing was music that made sense to them in that moment. And yeah. I think that's always been our mission, like sort of been my mission, which my mission has always been to play the punk of today. And some would punk, for me, on a, today, it's always it's about the new idea, not the old idea. It's yeah. not a sound, it's not a look. It's rather, it, the idea would be, like, if you're playing punk music, that's music that is challenging. It's creating something that other people don't do, and it's trend, it, but it has a quality that makes people, um, it makes people think. It kind of makes people feel connected. It's a, it, it celebrates music as the gathering point. And I think the Right to Spring definitely were trying to create music that brought people together as opposed to creating music that would just um, kind of bring people into a room so they could uh, behave in a certain way. So, no, we're not, I don't think they were changing the play. Hey, here's a new punk. Rather, I think it was a really natural evolution. And if you listen, study the Discord like box set, for instance, you can really hear it. It's really clear that, like a band like Beefeater, for instance, who started playing in 1984, yeah. that band sounded like nothing like Meyer Threat, and yet we're talking about only two years or a year after Meyer Threat broke up. Would you say the 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 values, the ethics change? Because you said it went more sort of larger political issues. You know, it changed. It I think that's just a natural progression for a yeah. community. Like that, if you're like when you're a little kid, like your like your issues are. Um, like, why can't I eat that candy? And why can't I watch that television show? And I'm bored, you know, I mean, or whatever, you know. And then as you get a little bit older, your world starts to get bigger and bigger, obviously. Yeah. You know, you start to, and I think sure. when you're a teenager, you're very caught up in the kind of, <clears throat> the politics of your immediate surroundings. Because, yeah, true. Yeah. Um, you're trying to develop relationship. You're, you're creating an ex a, a, a new family, a family outside of your biological family. But at some point, I think that that relationships, then you start realizing, wow, okay, like the, what, the, the me mechanisms within the community have, are certainly important, but this community is reliant on the external mechanisms as well. And you start thinking about the world you live in, you're like, well, fuck, man. Like, if I'm going to, you know, if I'm going to, like, be getting, like, being so focused on the way people treat each other within our community, shouldn't I be aware of, 
should I be thinking about the way people treat each other outside the community, especially in terms of people who are essentially in our employ, like the government, for instance. Yeah. You know, I think that you start to realize that if you live in the United States, like currently at the moment, like our government, this government in the United States, um, is actively paying people to murder other human beings all around the world. Something yeah. is not right about that. It's not, I don't think it's okay. And, you know, the same is true for England. You know, yeah. it's like there's, our government are paying people to kill people. And our money is what is paying them. And I feel like if you had an employee um, who was killing people, that's something to think about. So I, I think as I, I think as, when we were in the, our mid-20s, early to mid-20s, these are, I think, we started to think about. You know, obviously, it was a different time. There were other issues going on. But we felt like enough about ourselves. Like, if we really want to develop, we want to grow, then we need to think about the world we live in and our role in it. Uh, do, you think, do you think Revolution Summer ended at a certain point? Or did it carry on the years after? Well, I think I said that I felt like that it actually began before 85 and ended years later. Um, when I say ended, I mean, actually, I didn't say end. What I said was it affected people a year before and for years afterwards. And I suspect that, like, any idea, um, any constructive idea, that it continues to inspire people t to this day. That's yeah. the thing about music. I mean, again, we're talking about, you know, let me tell you, right to spring, like, for instance, talking about that band specifically, right to spring played... How many shows do you think Red Spring played? Let me ask you that question. What the, uh, oh, I'm not sure. The band. How many shows do you think they played? I'll say 200. Okay. They played 14 shows. 14. Else? Those 14 shows, 14 shows, right? That had an effect that people, has, can, music just kicks ass, it can kick ass. It, music can really affect people, and it continues. I think yeah. that is really... So in a way, the Revolution Summer can never be over, because the same way we were affected by earlier movements and earlier ideas, earlier creativity, you know, we try to return that favor, and, if, and it continues to do that. People continually to, they to think about it, and hopefully it inspires them to do something on their own. That's really the idea. Like, my motto has always been that music kicked my ass and I intend to return the favor. <laughs> it seems really straight up. It's a good way of looking at it, yeah. So, I mean, that's the thing that's so crazy. Like, yeah, I mean, I think Embrace played, maybe we played 10 shows, maybe more, I don't know. But like a band like SOA, which is Henry Rollins' first band, yeah, yeah. they played nine shows. <laughs> nine! It's crazy. Yeah. The lot of bands were like uh, getting together and separating pretty quickly. Is that right? Right. That's, yeah. That was just the nature of it. We were kids. You know how yeah. kids are. <laughs> yeah. I was one myself. <laughs> yeah. I mean, kids is fucking, you know, you get like your best friend one day and the next day you're like, fuck off. Oh, actually, yeah, you're right. Yeah. No, I had a but few bands. It is. You can't not. It's like it's so temperamental. Everything is moving at such a high you know, pace, it's, everything's just flying, so like, when you're in a band, like, you start playing, and you're like so passionate about it, but then suddenly it's like, you know, you know, it just immediately just goes up in flames, but like, within a day, like, there's another band already, because we were, nobody, nobody had, you know, nobody was really, you know, we had jobs, but they were all like part-time jobs, everybody would just, you know, just wanted to fucking do this, we wanted to be in bands, so there was such a pressure, and we wanted to do it so badly, so if a band broke up, you immediately went into another relationship. I think it's probably, it's a lot like, you know, teenage dating. Yeah. You know, it's like, like, people, they go out, and all of a sudden, they, they, this is like, it blows up, and then, then like a week later, they're going out with somebody else. Yeah. And I think it's just trying to figure out who you are by, um, you know, like how, uh, like, you know what pinging is? Like, what, sorry? It's ping. They go, some marina will ping. Do you know how that works? I don't, like I don't know. Some marina sends out a sonar and it, it pings and it, the way it, it looks for other things by just, it bounces sound, right? In the same way, I think, right. in relationships with young people, like, it's, they, they get involved with all these other people and all these other dimensions because it helps them recognize who they are. Do you understand? Yeah. Like this, you, you start to figure out who you are by the reflection of your interaction with other people. And that's how you discover who you are. 
Mm. The same way in bands, like you get into a band with one group of people, another group of people, but you slowly start to discover who you are and what your music is. Yeah, so you're just developing your identity. Like. That's what we do. Like we get born and we start developing our identity. <laughs> yeah. That's exactly right. And I suspect... Still trying to find mine. <laughs> I suppose it is possible that that is the arc of life, that when we stop developing identity is when we're dying. That's when we start to die. Yeah. We start to shut down the identity. And I think it's one of the reasons that there's such this weird, this weird kind of thing about adults. Like, I'm fucking almost 48 years old. But I still feel like I'm developing. Like, I'm not, I'm, I'm not taking it apart. But, you know, I know plenty of people who are my age who are so, like, yeah, that's in the past, and I'm just, I'm just, I'm just looking at Facebook now. Yeah, like that might be something to think about in terms of life. Is it like if you, when you stop, you stop, you know, living, you start dying. And I think that I know what you mean. developing an identity, that maybe that's a good lifelong objective. We're always developing who we are. We're learning more and more about ourselves. And as long as we keep doing that, then we don't have to really, then we never, we never really die. Ah, uh, yeah, it's kind of like keeping your sort of youthful spirit almost just you know definitely yeah well that's I mean, how like I see keeping it. your spirit which might be I think in a way the idea of spirit being youthful is a, is a misnomer you know I think that spirit is just a reality I think that it's when you stop your spirit that you lose you become old but it's not that you were young before it's just you're a person I think that there's an awful lot of um, I think that there is this tendency in our societies to treat kids as unreal. And the reason I say that is because they all, people often say, well, yeah, but what are you going to do when you get real? Like, when are you going to get real? Like, when are you going to become real and get a real job and become yeah, a real person? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but my position is, and I stand, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm serious about this. As far as I'm concerned, kids are real from day one. So if you're 12, you're fucking real. So live like it. If you're 15, you're real. Don't listen to people saying you're unreal. The like, ideas that kids have, they're legitimate ideas. Yeah, totally. And they should be treated as such. But unfortunately, we're all a little deluded by this sort of tendency in our society to dismiss young ideas. I know you And mean. I think it was precisely that kind of dismissal, that sense of dismissal, that made me so, um, so adamant to, to, that I was going to be heard one way or the other.